There's been a lot of talk about the status of the United States nuclear weapons. Their great power. They will be met with fire and fury. Their dire need for improvements. We have let our nuclear capabilities atrophy. And everything in between. But what exactly makes up the United States nuclear forces? And how do they compare to the rest of the world? Nuclear weapons are in a completely different category than conventional weapons. Depending on the country, um, they structure themselves differently depending on what they think is necessary. So let's start with the weapons themselves. The atomic bomb and its more powerful sibling, the hydrogen bomb. Both use uranium or plutonium to spark a nuclear reaction or a chain of reactions. The yield of these bombs, or how big their explosions are, has grown enormously since the first nuclear tests. The first nuclear weapons that were used um, by the United States back in 1945 had a yield of 15, the first one, and 20, the second one, uh, 20 kiloton. And that's explosive power equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT explosives going off in one bomb. In the early phases, that was almost like a, a race to see how powerful you could build them. Very quickly got into the hundreds of kilotons. Then you ended up in the megaton. And in theory, you could continue to make weapons more and more powerful. But very quickly, it became evident that it wasn't very useful. Because what do you get for that? Well, you get a lot of destruction, a lot of radioactive fallout that's going to drift everywhere. Um, and you can destroy so many things so many times over, but so what? Um, so gradually, as delivery systems got more accurate, they could turn down the yield, the power of the, the weapons. The US nuclear stockpile today has high and low yield warheads, ranging from the B-83, which has a yield of 1.2 megatons, to the B-61, which has a yield that can go as low as 0.3 kilotons. And as the explosive power of the bombs themselves was rising and falling, so was the number of warheads that countries had. You have a, an insane production of nuclear weapons happening through the 50s and, and, and 60s. At the peak, uh, the total number of weapons was on the order of 70,000 uh, weapons. The Cold War had gone nuts. Since the end of the Cold War, the trend has been very consistent going, uh, going south. Uh, fewer and fewer nuclear weapons. Now it's sort of um, leveling out a bit, where it is as if the nuclear weapon states are sort of slowing down the disarmament process. Right now, there's about 15,000 nuclear weapons in nine countries' stockpiles around the world. And even that is still enough to flatten dozens of cities, destroy crucial ecosystems, and kill millions. The smallest arsenal, according to Christensen's estimates, belongs to North Korea. Their arsenal right now is very, it's immature. It's, uh, it's, it's building um, in capacity. The largest arsenals still belong to the Cold War rivals. But those massive arsenals of nuclear bombs are only one part of a country's nuclear forces. Another crucial part are the delivery systems for those weapons, which is how countries launch bombs to their intended targets. That's where the nuclear triad comes in. You may have heard it mentioned before. The three legs of the triad, though, do you have a priority? Because I want to go to Senator Rubio well, I, I after think, that. I think him. to me, look, nuclear is just the, the power, the devastation is very important to me. It's a three-pronged military force structure to launch nuclear weapons, developed during the Cold War and still maintained by the U.S. and Russia. The triad is supposed to ensure that some of a nation's nuclear weapons could survive a first strike attack and launch a successful second strike back at the attacking nation. All these delivery systems and warheads need a big support apparatus. There's the infrastructure to build, maintain, and modernize nuclear weapons, management and education processes so people know how to operate them, command and control systems to keep them in a state of readiness, oversight mechanisms, and declaratory government policy about when to use them. And it gets costly. The US already directs about 5.5% of its defense budget just toward its nuclear forces. And the cost is expected to rise with the arsenal's modernization needs and could swallow up to 8% of defense spending by the late 2020s. The current modernization program, to the best we can see, is not sustainable economically. So we'd have to cut some conventional programs 
and use that on nuclear instead. And that's a huge dilemma inside military planning. But international tensions are on the rise along with costs. As flare-ups with Russia become more commonplace, and volatile threats are exchanged with North Korea. The U.S. will have to make tough decisions about its nuclear priorities. And soon.